For those of you who don't know me, my name's Adam. I'm one of the elders here. I'm going to kind of move things around because I tend to be a little animated and move around, and I, I use my hand a lot, um, and I don't want to mock, knock over anything. Um, so welcome to City on a Hill. Um, we are in the book of Mark. We've just started. Um, we preach exegetically, so we're going to go through the entire book of Mark. And so if you're new here, I'm super excited um, because we just started. I think we're in our fifth week, and we're on verse, or on cha- or on verse 14 of chapter 1. So we're moving very quickly through the, the book of Mark. And um, I want to preface this sermon um, with uh, just kind of a call for next week's sermon, which is always interesting because I'm preaching this week, but we're going to talk about next week. Um, next week, we will be um, kind of vision casting and going over um, one of our DNAs as a church, and that is church planting. And we are part of the Acts 29 network, um, which essentially means that we um, spiritually and then genero- with genera- generosity, there we go, um, we, we put a, an, an abundance of um, emphasis on the spread of the gospel through the churches. And in, in very practical means, this is what it means. That, that we give 10% of all of the tithes, or excuse me, 1% of all of our tithes goes to Acts 29 so that they can go through and they can vet all of the church planners that we're sending out. And why is that important? Well, it's important because um, when church planters aren't vetted, when they haven't been taught, when they're not resourced well, what, resourced well, what happens is they go out and their church plants fail, and then the people who were coming to those church plants are disastrously hurt. And, and we see it over and over again. And so we as a church have, have, have said, look, we want to make sure that we resource them well, whether that's through our money or through Tim and Kelly's uh, time. They've gone up, and I think they've vetted something like 100 church planters throughout the Midwest, um, making sure that our church planters are good, ready, qualified, and resourced well to go out and proclaim the gospel. And then the other part of that is 10% of all of the giving that we have for the tithe goes to church planting. Now, we have not planted a church out of here um, in a traditional way yet, but we do resource uh, both Kempton Turner over in um, East St. Louis in an area that we're not going to, and then Burks, right, um, up in North City. So we continue to, to send our money into church plants so that the gospel is proclaimed into marginalized areas. And it's important that we discuss that before we get into Mark chapter 1. Because what we're going to transition into is from Jesus getting baptized to getting moved out 40 days into the wilderness, and now he's starting his ministry. So Jesus is starting his ministry, and it's our first time in which we see in the Gospel of Mark um, what we're getting called into. What is the ministry of Christ Jesus? And so Mark starts off like this. He says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee. So it gives us a time and a place. He doesn't stop and give us a a whole detailed list of what happens um, with John the Baptist. He's going to, in chapter 6, kind of uh, flesh that out for us. Um, But that's not his point for this particular passage. He wants us to know that that John has been arrested. Um, There's a subsequent death to John the Baptist, and, and Jesus is in Galilee. And so we see that Jesus is now preaching into his local congregation. He's he's preaching in to the Jewish people. And so he sets a time and a place for us to kind of understand and, and, and specifically um, start, to catal- start to understand where his ministry is, is being placed. And so he continues to go on. Um, and this is really where the meat gets in. He's proclaiming the gospel of God. And so this is where we start to, to think about what is the gospel of God and, and what is the ministry that we provide? What is, the, what is this church that Jesus has called into? And it, it gets really simple here, but that's what makes it so hard. The proclamation of the gospel is our missional objective. The good news of the gospel, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, that death no longer has a hold on you. You are free to walk out of the grave like we just sang and proclaim the glories of Jesus. You are no longer dead, but you're alive. That is the central message of the gospel. Jesus loved you so much that he came down from the cosmos, put on this very fleshy sin, became human so that he could live the life that you couldn't. 
So the proclamation of the gospel is our missional objective, and it forces us to be reliant on God's provisional power, providential power, and not our genius or our charisma. Because here's the reality. If our only missional objective is to preach the gospel, then we have to be reliant on God's promises and God's strength and God's power for any movement to happen. Let me put it in a different way. I know that you are all beautiful. I can see you. And you're very charismatic, and you have brilliant geniuses in, in all of the places that, that you know you're brilliant geniuses. I know. I can see you. You're geniuses and brilliant and charismatic. But if the proclamation of, or the movement of the gospel depends on you, then we will have absolutely no movement of the gospel. Because you can't change hearts. Last time I, I checked, there's nobody in this room that could bring dead men to life. There's nobody in, the room, in this room that has knitted a baby in a mother's womb. There's, there's no one in this room who, who has taken a heart of stone and, and turned it into a heart of flesh. And the power that we may perceive that we have is only very limited in nature and scope. And we as a people are easily, easily distracted. Like I can sit down to read a book, and in two seconds later, I'm thinking about anything and everything that is not this book, right? I can sit down at work, and, and I've got a whole day planned out and mapped out exactly what I'm going to do, and it takes like one email to send me in complete chaos. Like, this is a reality that if, 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 if we are, as a church, going to go out and do the ministry of, of Jesus, then we better hope that there is a God, that there is a power behind us that's backing us, that's moving us, that's doing the work. And that hits our, that hits our hearts and our, our pride. But it's, it's simple, and it's free. Because one of the things that we as a, as a church body um, have done over the course of many, many years is we've tried to, to complicate what Jesus' mission was. So we'll say, well, you need to preach the gospel, but you can't dance. That will make sure that you, the proclamation of the gospel goes out. Or, or you need to preach the gospel, but you, you can't have any drinks. You need to preach the gospel, but you have to do it in a way in which you hand people tracts and go out and, and give them a piece of paper, and that will be the proclamation of the gospel. And so we've taken all of these complex ways in our genius and in our humanity and, and tried to overcomplicate it. And I'm here to tell you, church, it's, it's simple. Jesus started his mission with this, proclaiming the gospel of God. So we have to be reliant on his providential power. We have to have hope that he is moving in the hearts of the people that we're talking to and we're loving. We have to declutter ourselves from the complexities in which we try to tie to the mission and realize that the mission of God is going out in loving people. Whether that's your coworkers, whether that's the, 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 the lady at Starbucks, whether that's the, the woman checking you out at Schnooks or, or your babysitter or your family members. Love God and love his people. The, this is the, the gospel and the mission of God. And Jesus continues to, to, to go on this thought process. He says, in saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So he just lays out his whole ministry in one line. One line. The time is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And so let's break it down. The time is fulfilled. This is, this is one of the most uh, uh, heavy-weighted passages I think that I've ever contemplated. And what Jesus is saying is that he's fulfilling the prophetic utterances of the Old Testament. So the Old Testament, like we discussed last week, is, is this whole journey of Israel going forth and failing and stumbling and God redeeming them and bringing them back and them failing and, and, and going over the course. And, and 
that entire time, you see prophetic of utterances of one to come, one who is going to redeem the world back into its original state in Genesis as it was in the beginning. The entire Old Testament is pointing towards Christ Jesus, and, and this should stir our hearts. Because what Jesus is saying is, is I am the, the fulfillment of the plan of redemption that God has been promise, promising since the beginning, since the original sin of Adam. I am he, I'm here. John the Baptist said one is coming and I'm the guy. I am the guy. And so you say, well, well, well how does that stir my heart for Jesus? What is, I understand that he's linked to the Old Testament and, and that's theologically heavy and I, I get that. So I have a friend and he lives in Jupiter, Florida and uh, his name is Mike and um, yesterday, Saturday, he uh, um, he had uh, the service for uh, his wife, and, and she's passed away. Um, she went 13 rounds with chemo, colon cancer. Um, she was a, this little petite blonde woman, very beautiful. And um, she, her whole goal, and he was telling me this on the, on the phone on Friday, was that um, we're gonna, I, I just want to make it to 55. Like the doctors are saying that there's probably no way that this cancer is getting um, beaten. I mean, it's just, it's done but I just want to make it to 55. And so two weeks after 55, uh, the cancer caught her, and God uh, brought her home. And so I call up my friend Mike on, Saturday, or on Friday, and, and, and I want to tell him that, that it's okay that, that this happened. And I, I shared another story uh, that I shared last week. I, I won't go all the way into it. But, um, and I shared that story with him, and he said, Adam, I want you to hear this. He said, Kathy, his, his wife, um, every day, I never, there was not a time in, the, in all of cancer that I heard her complain. Not once. She never complained. She was never down on herself. She never, she never yelled at God. She wasn't angry. She sat in her chair and, and she turned on worship music. And she just praised God knowing that his promises of there will be no more death and no more crying and no more pain anymore would eventually come. Whether it's on this side of earth or when he pulls me back. But, but this is pain is temporary. This cancer is temporary. It may take my body, but that body is just a gift in which I've been sent out to, to sojourn. She said, I, I, I'm just here, and I know it hurts, and I, I can't really eat, and, and I know I'm deteriorating away, but my hope is not in, in this. My hope is seeing Jesus face to face. And so this passage, when it says that there is a, that, that the time has come, that the prophecies have been fulfilled, that, that, that Jesus has come to make that, that's, that's the reality of what Kathy is saying. She's saying that, look, we as a, as a body, we as Christians can hang our hope on the fact that Jesus Christ is the one. He has fulfilled the prophecies. He is redeeming all things. And so if Kathy can stand, sit there, and proclaim the glories of God while colon cancer is wasting away her bodies, then we as a people can look about and go, yes, yes, there will be a time where there is no more pain and no more crying anymore. But that time is, is not just when Jesus comes and, and he brings you back into him and he takes you to heaven. Because Jesus continues to go on, he said, and the kingdom of God is at hand. So last week we, we talked about how Jesus was in the wilderness and Adam was in the garden and Jesus was tempted and he, he did not sin and Adam was tempted and he fell into sin. And I got a question, of course, after the sermon. And the question was this. Well, Adam really wasn't the one who sinned, it was Eve. That was the one who ate the apple. And I said, well, you know, that's, that's true. It still works. Paul said it. I'm good. <laughs> but just as we talk about the propitiation of righteousness or, or Jesus' righteousness given to you as a free gift, Adam's sin also cascaded down. 
into everything. Paul says every molecule in Romans was absolutely tainted by sin. Every molecule. That means you, me, the chairs that you sit in, uh, the Android phones that you have. I think apples are redeemed. Your iPhone's good. But what you're going to see, and this is, this is beautiful, what you're going to see is when Jesus says the kingdom is hand, at hand, what he's saying in a, in a very real statement is that I am redeeming the things of this world. And we're, as we go through Mark, you're going to see Jesus' ministry redeeming the sin that Adam created. So as soon as we get done and next week we go into uh, the next passage in Mark that we're going to preach, immediately... Jesus cast out a demon. He's reversing the effects of sin. And he continually does this over and over again. Each miracle is a, 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 a turning or a redemption of sin. He's turning back sin because the kingdom of God is at hand. And so I want you to hear this in a, in a very real way. Because as we see Jesus' ministry turning and he's reversing the effects of sin, when he dies and he's resurrected, and just before the ascension, he says to his people, he says, now go therefore and make disciples. I want you to continue my ministry and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And behold, I'll be with you forever and always. And then he also leaves them with a promise. That promise that the same Holy Spirit that allowed him to stay uh, out of sin in wilderness, also the same spirit that pushed him into the wilderness, as we found out last week. The same spirit that was working in him, allowing him to do the miracles, is the same spirit that lives and dwells in you. The spirit of Jesus lives and dwells in you. And so if you take that and you pair that with the kingdom of God that is at hand, what you end up with is this brilliant concept. It's brilliant. You are the kingdom of God. You, each and every one of you, makes up the kingdom of God. And what Jesus has done is he said, We're, I'm sending you out so that I can use my plan of redemption through you. And I know that, that, that is, is a little confusing and it was confusing for the Jews that are hearing this message for the first time. See, the Jews thought that um, when Jesus came in and he said um, that I'm going to be king, that they were going to get a, a David, or they were going to get a, a Solomon, or they were going to get any one of the other kings that they had seen. And, and when God talks about giving his, his land back to his people, the, the Jews thought, oh, we're going to get, um, we are going to go ahead and get a uh, governmental win here. Like, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to overthrow Rome and we're going to have our land back and it's going to be glorious. The king is there. And we fall in that same issue here in the United States, right? Like, if you look at anything in the political spectrum at this point in time, you see the evangelical world going, oh, if we could only elect church leaders into the government, everything would be okay. Like if our, our representatives or our senators or our president or our vice president or whoever, if they were only Christians and good Christians, then everything would be okay. We would have a nation of Christians and it would all come back together and everything would be glorious. The problem with that, while I wouldn't mind having some people with ethics in, 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 in Washington, like don't get me wrong, like I'm serious, some ethics in Washington would be a win. So I want you to hear that. But the problem with that is that both Jesus and Paul give us a much different picture. Jesus, when he's presented with this idea of, should we pay taxes to Caesar, asks the Pharisees, he said, well, hand me a denarius. And he looks at it, and he goes, who's on that denarius? Well, it's Caesar. Okay, give to Caesar's what is Caesar's. And Paul continues in Romans, and he says, look, we need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for them, but we are subjected under the authority in which God has placed those leaders in. And so if you take those and you go, well, okay, maybe God didn't design a theocracy in which the United States would become a Christian nation, and that's how he's going to propel his mission. 
No, that's not what he said. He said, I have brought dead men to life so that they could pro pro proclaim the glories of me. So what does it look like? Does it mean that we've got to recalculate all of our lives and we have to shift everything and we need to become missionaries out in the mission field and go to Uganda? Maybe. Maybe that's where God's calling you. That might be a reality for someone in this room. A church plant in Uganda would be pretty sweet. But maybe for those of us in our room, in this room, that reality means that, that we breach the this, this sacred secular divide. That we combine them when we make it all secular because we have been made in the Imago Dei, the image of Jesus. That everywhere we go, in every touch that we have, every conversation that we engage in, that that's a missional opportunity in which Jesus is working through us so that his light can be shown into the world. Maybe it's that we don't have to reorient everything that we do. Maybe it's that everything that we do orients, or orients around the gospel. And so the kingdom is at hand. And then he makes the, the, hard, the hard gospel. He says, repent and believe in the gospel. And so he's calling the Jews and us today to repent and believe in the Gospels. And you're going to see that as we continue down this passage, that, that this is God's intent for all of his people. From the beginning until when Jesus comes back is for us to turn away from our idol, idols. Turn away from the things in which consume us that are, are not Jesus. And become worshipers holy of him that we don't make good things the best thing. Because there is only one best thing, and that is Christ Jesus. That is not to say you can't enjoy a great steak. That is not to say that you can't enjoy a football game or a baseball game. Next year for baseball, we're coming back. But that is to say we do all things unto the Lord Christ Jesus, whether we work or we play, and we enjoy him. And so Jesus continues on and he calls his disciples. Uh, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and he left their father Zebedee in the boat with hired servants and followed him. So there's a couple of things here. First off, I was going to preach out of A River Runs Through It because I thought it was a brilliant movie that everybody had seen. But here to find out, there's like four people that actually have watched that movie. So Repent and Believe, that's a great movie. It's 1992, so I'm showing my age a little bit here, but it's a great. So I, I won't do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of understanding about that idea of what it means to be fishers of men. I don't have any real clever areas of fishers of men. I know lots of men have preached on, on what are all the nuances of fishing and, and how that relates to being fishers of men. What I'm going to do is give you that, that theological uh, view from Jeremiah as we get into it which will kind of solidify the rest of the message. So, John, or excuse me, Mark writes, immediately upon being called, the disciples dropped everything that they had and they began to follow Christ Jesus. Now, I, I want you to hear that word, immediately. This wasn't like Jesus walked up and said, hey guys, I've got a really great strategy for church planting, and let me, let me show you my booklet, and I want you to think about it, and I want you to pray for it, and, and I want you to maybe come, come, come with me and hang out. No. Jesus walks in, and when you see the face of the Messiah, when you meet the real Jesus face to face, and he calls you into his mission, there is an immediacy. We dropped our nets, we dropped everything, and we're here. We're here to follow you. This is not the, ah, I've heard of Jesus. 
And maybe I'll, I'll maybe kind of come in and, and hang out there. This is, I'm here. And they followed him. And so Jesus says, follow me. He didn't say, hey, uh, my new disciples, uh, could you come follow me? And if you don't really want to, you can go about and do your own thing and I'll follow you. That's not what he said. But in our the way that we've kind of handled Jesus over the past 150 years, what we've uh, devalued him to is, hey, Jesus, I've got this great mission, this great idea, this great life that I'm going to build and I'm going to figure it out. And if you could come down from heaven and kind of co-sign to my mission, I got to figure it out. Just co-sign to it. I need your power. I get it. I can't actually do it on my own. Not what he says. He says very simply, follow me. So I got to thinking about what does it mean to, to follow Jesus? And of course, those initial thoughts are always like, well, you probably should read your Bible more, which you should. I'm, I'm saying that we should probably do that, and we should probably pray more, which you should. That's, that's something that we need. Um, but what does it really mean to, to follow Jesus? And so I came up with a couple of things. A couple of things that I see in, in Jesus' ministry throughout all of the Gospels that, that I think are, are relevant here. The first is this. That Jesus went to those who are marginalized. The downtrodden, the others, the outcasts. This was not a, hey, we've got a great billboard, come to our church, we'd love it for you to come in, we accept everybody, drug addicts and soccer moms and everybody. He went to the marginalized people and he proclaimed the gospel to them. He was moved into mission. And as a church, as a body, we have to see that as a primary goal in which we move. To see the marginalized, to hear their stories, to feel their pain, and to lay the balm, the healing balm of the gospel onto those stories. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And the second thing that I see that Jesus is constantly engaged in his prayer to the Father. Like it's throughout all of the Gospels. He would go out and he would minister his people and he would pull back and he would pray. And then he would go out and he would minister to his people and he would go back and, and pray. And he would go out and minister his people and then we would go back and, and then he would pray. And it seems to be this reoccurring theme in which Jesus is constantly engaging God the Father in prayer. But it doesn't appear to me, through reading the scriptures, that anywhere Jesus was offering half-hearted prayers in which we kind of throw out there on our way to work without expectation. See, when I see Jesus praying to the Father, what I see is he's expecting that the Father is going to move on his prayer. That they are, they are absolutely and in line with their beliefs, and that as Jesus is praying to the Father, that demons are, are, are cast out, that lepers are healed, dead men are walking, even if for another short time. I see that Jesus' prayer has an effect on his ministry, which is not accountable in any humanistic thing that we can do. There is a reality in which communion with God brings us closer in line with his will, in which prayer in, in some different way causes mission to explode. It, it causes love to go forth. And here's what else it does. It may be the most primary way, as it sets us right size with God. Because if we're going to pray, and we're going to come to the Father, and we're going to repent and believe the gospel, and we're going to see our failings, and we're going to see our celebrations, and we're going to go to the Father and, and proclaim His glories back to Him and truths back to Him, and we're going to call on those promises in prayer for His people. It sets a state in our worship that is much greater 
than if we just live our mundane lives and kind of doing things in, in our normal Christian stance. Prayer changes things. It changes how we look at the world. I'll give you an example. So we meet, uh, me and a couple other men meet on Thursday mornings at 5.30. Because 5.30 is a great time to pray. Oh, y'all didn't think that was funny, did you? <laughs> 5.30 is a great time to pray. Because everybody's still a little sleepy, the coffee hasn't kicked in. Um, so you're a little bit more uh, raw with, with how you feel. And so I, I, I was listening to the men kind of walk through their days where they're failing and where they're doing well and we're applying the gospel and we're doing all this wonderful work on my kitchen counter. And what I did um, in this particular day was in my, my list, because I'm a list guy, I have a list of prayers for people, and I've shared this. But instead of just writing, hey, I'm going to pray for Mike, or I'm going to pray for John, or I'm going to pray for Ethan, or whoever, I wrote, I'm going to pray for John. And here's five things that I heard that he needs prayer for. Five things. And so throughout the day, as I'm praying for John, it's not just the Jesus uh, continue to work in John's heart. Um, and I, I know he loves you, but he needs to love you more. And hopefully he can kind of contain me and all of the things that I do now that he's going to be the deacon in charge of Adam Sloggett. Which was actually floated as one of his deacon responsibilities. <laughs> Yeah, I know. So, he, so, so the, my point is, is not that, that, that um, I just said the prayer for John, which I'm not saying that those prayers are, are meaningless. But what it did is make me reflect back on all of the things that John and I had talked about through that day. It set me in a different place in which I could love John better. My prayer was, was then detailed. My prayer was, was then almost a communion with, with me and God and, and, and this intercessory prayer for John. And what I found was, is my prayer was much deeper, my worship much greater, because I realized, A, I can't fix John's problems, but B, God can. And so this idea of prayer and interceding and for the people that are in your lives is important, and we see this in Jesus' ministry. And then for the one that everyone loves, the one that, that everyone loves, what does it mean to follow Jesus? It means that you're going to be persecuted. It means that you are going to be persecuted. In our leadership um, prayer, our leadership training prayer uh, the other night, uh, we were walking through Acts, and it was identified for the hundredth time that the church explodes, that the movement of the gospel is massive when persecution falls down on the church. Every time, every movement, every, ev everything comes down when the church is persecuted. And so for you individually as members of the kingdom, if you are going to follow Jesus, you will be persecuted. And Jesus is better. So what does persecution look like? Well, persecution might look like um, you proclaim the glories of, of Jesus Christ to your coworker, and he doesn't really want to talk to you anymore because now you're that weird Christian that's trying to push your beliefs. That might happen. That is a form of persecution. It might mean that you're outcast from your family. As you proclaim the glories of Christ Jesus to your family, they say, we don't want to hear it. That's, that's, that's not what we believe. That might mean that somebody chops your head off because they don't believe in Christ Jesus. Maybe not anybody in this room. We're not quite there at the United States level. But we've got brothers in Somalia, Iraq, Iran. There are Kurdish Christians in Syria. Christians in Syria. Hong Kong's looking a little desolate right now. There's Christians all over in which the, the proclamation of Jesus Christ as Lord may mean that you may lose your head. But let's remember, they put Lord Jesus Christ up on a cross and they beat him almost to death. Persecuted, having had no sin. So to follow Jesus may mean that that's where we go. 
And if that's the case, praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. And for some death. And for some death. And so my prayer today is that we would have a, such a missional outreach in our, our small congregation that, that we, would, we would be burdened with the prayer that we sent somebody out into an area because they were called by Christ Jesus and moved into a place like Uganda. That we could pro proclaim the glories. We could pray on a level for, the, for people that are facing that. Because Jesus made no bones about it, he says, follow me. And then he goes on, he says, and I will make you fishers of men. And, and like I said earlier, there are, there are lots of pastors who have done very clever things with that passage. And, and by all means, that was great. But this passage is actually a reflection back into Jeremiah. So the fulfillment of what Jeremiah is saying is now being fulfilled through Christ Jesus in you. And I want you to read this passage. Or I want you to hear this passage. And I want it to, to kind of set upon you in the understanding that from the very beginning, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, this is God's plan for you. Before you were a twinkle in your mom, mother's eye, he had a plan set for you. Now, Jeremiah is not preaching uh, directly to you, but he is preaching uh, to the restoration of Israel. And so the fishers of men comes from this passage. So Jeremiah says this, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country and out of the countries where he had driven them. For I will bring them back to their land which I gave them fa their fathers. So he sets, the, he sets the stage. Jeremiah says, just as Israel uh, was pulled out of Egypt, um, now Israel is living up in the northern encampments and I will bring them back down. I'm going to bring all of my people back down. And he says, Behold, I am sending many fishers, declares the Lord, and they shall catch them. And afterwards I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them on every mountain and every hill and out of every cleft of the rock. For my eyes are on their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. But first, I will doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, because they have polluted my land, land with carcasses of detestable idols. Some strong language. Carcasses of detestable idols. And they have filled my inheritance with their abominations. And so what, what God is saying here is that I am going to bring fishers and hunters, fishers of men from all walks of life, and I will go from east to west to north to south, and I will continue to bring people into my kingdom. And this is beautiful because it starts to give us an imagery of what the kingdom is going to look like in Revelation, where every tribe and every nation and every tongue is, come back, to get, is, come, is back together in a full worship. And God is saying, these hunters, these fishers, these are you, my family. These are you, my church. I have called you out of death into, into life for the purpose of bringing my people into the kingdom. Not a kingdom in the United States, not a kingdom anywhere, but a kingdom in which I will reign forever and ever in the new heavens and the new earth. There will be no more pain and no more crying and no more tears anymore. We will redeem the world back as it was in the garden. The imagery is amazing. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue worshiping Christ Jesus in utter perfection. And so it's prophesied straight out of Jeremiah into the fulfillment of Christ Jesus that he would send you out there. But he doesn't end it there. Jeremiah continues to go on. He says, O oh Lord, my strength and my stronghold, my refuge in the day of trouble, to you shall the nations come from the ends of the earth and say, our fathers have inherited nothing but lies. The world has given us nothing but lies. 
worthless things in which there is no profit. The idols in which we hold so tightly to. Can man make himself gods? Such not are gods. Therefore, behold, I will make them know, this once I will make them know, my power and my might, and they shall know that my name is Lord. And so you have out of that passage, fishers of men, this this almost transportation into Matthew 28 in which Jesus says, I will be with you forever and always. And so the daunting mission of every tribe and every nation and every tongue, hearing the gospel and proclaiming the gospel throughout all of those, no longer sits as a weight on you, but as a promise that God said will happen. And so the ministry of Christ Jesus is very simple. Love God, love his people, go out to his people, and love them well. Amen? All right, let me pray, and then we're going to move into a a time of communion. Um, I have two communion stations set up here, and um, I thought it would be appropriate that the elders uh, serve communion today as we, as we bring in and hearken in our deacons. Um, and I want, during this time of communion, just come up. Um, if you're a believer in Christ, we practice open communion here. Um, and I, I just want you to take some time and, and, and think through that idea that, um, that, that we have idols that are continually going on in our minds, that we, we've hold, held on to as, as taking good things and being the best things. And maybe where we can um, be the light of Jesus into areas in which we've kind of separated from being secular. Just where can we be better missionaries? And then the last thing I want you to do, and I, I want you to fervently pray for this, is that as we as a church have proclaimed from our very beginning that we have a DNA of church planting that we would go back to those, those roots of church planting and that we, would start to, um, that we would start to allocate and understand what that would look for, like in our body, that we may plant someone out um, for the proclamation of uh, the gospel, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we come before you recognizing that we are, are powerless um, in, in the redemption of the body. But we thank you that you are redeeming us. And we thank you that you are redeeming the world around us. We thank you that you have promised from the beginning of time that that you would redeem and you would restore things back to their original place. And we thank you that you didn't just wind us up and send us off on this mission, that um, you provided us with the power of your Holy Spirit, God living inside of us to propel us in our day-to-day, everyday activities, to proclaim the gospel, and that we, can, that we can hold on to as our stronghold and our refuge. And Jesus, we, we repent right now as, as oftentimes we have forgotten about um, that time in which you were put up on a cross, that your body was broken uh, for us and that your blood was poured out for the forgiveness of our, for our sins. And we thank you, Jesus, that we are now um, called sons and daughters of the Most High King, that we have been given your righteousness because we are covered in your blood. And I pray, Jesus, just as we uh, partake in communion, as we break the bread and we, we dip it into the, to the blood, that we, we recognize that we are called to so much more than than just living a life here on earth. That we're called to eternity, an eternity that you have promised will be perfect with you. We love you. Amen.